I think we'll get started. Magaseka Chanting Book, page 95. The Metta Nisangsa Sutta. We'll start out with some benefits of Metta. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Evang me sutang ekang samayang bhagava savati ang viharati jetavane anatha pindakasa arame. Tatra ko bhagava bhikkhu amante si bhikkavo ti badante ti te bhikkhu bhagavato pachasso sum bhagava etad davocha metaya bhikkave chaitu vimuttiya asevittaya bhavittaya bahulikataya yani kataya vatukataya anuk Taya parichitaya susamara deaya eka dasani sansa patikanka katame eka dasa sukang supati sukang pati budjati na papa kang supinang pasati manusanang piohoti amanusanang piohoti devata rakanti nasa agiva visangva sat. Tangva kamati tu vatang chetang samadhiati mukkavanno vipasidati asamulho kalyang karoti uttaring apatit vajanto brahma brahma loko paggo hoti metteya brahma bhikkave chetum vimuttiya asevataya bhavataya bahuli kataya Yani kataya, vatu kataya, anutta, anuttitaya, parichataya, <coughs> susamaradaya, mime ekadasi nasingsa, patikankati, edanga vocha bhagava, atamana te bhikkhu, bhagavato, bhasetum, abenandunti. Now the English. Discourse on benefits of loving friendliness, thus have I heard. On one occasion, the sublime one was living in Savati, at Jeta's Grove in the park of Anatha Pindika. <laughs> there, the sublime one addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. The sublime one said this. Bhikkhus, there are 11 benefits from the practice of loving friendliness that arise from the emancipation of the heart. If repeated, developed, made much of, made a habit of, made a basis... Experience, practice, well undertaken, 11 benefits are to be expected. What 11? One sleeps well, one gets up well, one does not have nightmares. One is pleasing to human beings, one is pleasing to non-human beings. The deities protect one. Neither fire nor poison nor weapon can affect one. One's mind becomes calm immediately. One's complexion brightens. One dies without confusion, and beyond that, if one does not comprehend the highest, one goes to the world of the Brahmas. Bhikkhus, these are the eleven benefits from the practice of loving friendliness that arise from the emancipation of the heart. If repeated, developed, made much of, made a habit of, made a basis of, experience, practice, well begun, these eleven benefits are to be expected. Thus spoke the Sublime One. Delighted, those Bhikkhus rejoiced in what the Sublime One had said. Oh, Adriana. All right. So the 11 benefits of metta, <clears throat> right? If you practice metta lots and lots, then you can expect these uh, 11 benefits, right? So friends, welcome to Dhammapalooza. Another Monday night, another Dhammapalooza. <clears throat> Here still at the farm. <clears throat> we'll be for another month and a half or so. And uh, I don't know, if, is there anybody brand new to Dhammapalooza? There's not too many people on, and I think most of you are in the chat. But as if there is anybody new, uh, as we do here at Dhammapalooza every Monday night, 
Um, I like to let the community um, have a hand in guiding how this Dhammapalooza is going to be. Ah, yay. Welcome. A millionaire. Did I say that right? <laughs> That's an interesting name. So how this, uh, we have two hours, right? No, nobody has to stay the whole two hours, but if you'd like to, you can get the full experience. And we do a, a variety of different things, right? So I did some chanting. Uh, we're going to do some guided meditation. Um, and in between that, it's up to you guys in a way. So if you have um, any topics you'd like me to discuss or the community to discuss, last week it was great. The community in the chat was really chatting, debate, talking to each other and all kinds of stuff. It was good, right? So chat talking in the chat is perfectly fine. Um, it doesn't interrupt me. This is a community event, right? This is supposed to be that everybody comes together <clears throat> um, and you can, you know, talk, talk and discuss in the chat. Um, so right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a minute or two and I'm going to see if anybody has any questions that you'd like to ask me about Buddhism, meditation, monastics, um, any uh, um, any topics you'd like me or the community to, to discuss. So anything like that, you can type it in the chat. Um, and if nobody has anything, I have a sutta for us to read. Hey, Chris, welcome. Oh, a millionaire is on the Discord with us. Okay. Very cool. Chris must have been um, hiking and meditating in the woods. He hasn't been around in a while. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, I don't see any questions or topics. So let's do our sutta. Um, for those of you who use Sutta Central, you might have noticed that Sutta Central magically just changed everything today. <laughs> I went on it <clears throat> and uh, it wasn't working. And then I was refreshing, refreshing. And then it came back. I'm like, what is this new Sutta Central? Ugh. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's better than the old one, but it's at least, at the very least, it's different. So I had to refresh everything. But I think uh, we will read. I have been waiting. I've had this sutta waiting for about four um, uh, Dhammapaloozas. <laughs> right? I basically kind of gave up, but actually I did it... Um, the only person here who uh, who was at my um, Saturday session on Second Life was Adriana. So she's the only one who's who will have heard this sutta already. But this is a wonderful sutta that we're going to do. It's with Gatikara. So Adriana, for you, this is a repeat, but still, it's a good sutta. So it's, so it's good to hear it again. So this um, this one, this sutta with Gatikara is one of the few suttas. <laughs> well, I mean, I technically spoil the ending right in the beginning while I'm explaining it, right? So, <laughs> but yeah, don't tell them who, who it was. But so this um, sutta is one of the few suttas that... Um, that uh, the Buddha talks about a former life of his, right? Now, later on, there came to be lots of stories of the Buddha's former lives, and they created the, the section of the Pali Canon called for the Jataka tales. But in the early text, there's only like three, four, maybe, suttas where the Buddha talks about a past life of his, right? And this is one of them. So this is a very good sutta, has a, um, lots of good dhamma in it, and it's a you know a, a rare sutta in that you get to see the Buddha talking about a past life. So I made the link. All right. Uh, 
All right. I'm going to refrain from being grumpy about the new suit to Central. How the heck do I do this? <laughs> Where is it? All right. Okay. So, at one time, the Buddha was wandering in the land of the coastlands together with a large Sangha of mendicants. Then the Buddha left the road, and at a certain spot, he smiled. Then Venerable Ananda thought, what is the cause? What is the reason why the Buddha smiled? Realize ones do not smile for no reason. So Ananda got up from his seat, arranged his robe over one shoulder, raised his joined palms towards the Buddha, and said, what is the cause? What is the reason why the Buddha smiled? Realize ones, do not smile for no reason. Once upon a time, Ananda, there was a market town in this spot named Vebhalinga. It was successful and prosperous and full of people. And Kasapa, a blessed one, a perfected one, a fully awakened Buddha, lived supported by Vebhalinga. This is also one of the rare places in the suttas where you get to um, see a named um, and interact with a named former Buddha. Right? It was here, in fact, that he had his monastery where he sat and advised the mendicant Sangha. Then Ananda spread out his outer robe, folded him four and said to the Buddha, well then, sir, may the blessed one sit here. Then this piece of land will have been occupied by two perfected ones, fully awakened Buddhas. The Buddha sat on, <clears throat> on the seat spread out. When he was seated, he said to the venerable Ananda, Once upon a time, Ananda, every good story starts, with one, starts out with once upon a time, right? <laughs> once upon a time, Ananda, That's uh, that's Bhante Sujato making it nice. The the Pali word just says formerly, <laughs> basically like in the past, um, there was a market town in this spot named Vebhalinga. It was successful and prosperous and full of people. And Kasapa, a blessed one, a perfected one, a fully awakened Buddha, lived and supported by Vebhalinga. It was here, in fact, that he had his monastery, where he sat and advised the mendicant Sangha. The Buddha Kasapa had a chief supporter in Vebhalinga, a potter named Gatikara. Gatikara had a dear friend named Jyotipala, a Brahmin student. Then Gatikara addressed Jyotipala, Come, dear Jyotipala, let's go to see the Blessed One Kasapa, <clears throat> the Perfected One, the Fully Awakened Buddha. For I regard it as holy to see the Blessed One. When he said this, Jyotipala said to him, Enough, dear uh, Gatikara. What is the use of seeing that baldy, that fake ascetic? So this word here, uh, Mundaka, this is a very common, a little innovative Dhamma. So this word Mundaka is a very common insult towards Buddhist monks um, in the suttas. Shaveling, shaven head and shaven headed ascetic, right? So obviously, so at the time, you know, the Brahmins, they had long hair, maybe like dreadlocks even, like really long, elaborate hair. And they yeah, had baldy. And um, it was fairly common among some Samanas, not all, um, among the Buddhist tradition, uh, you know, other, those who followed the Buddha, yes, they did. Um, but it was somewhat uh, common in the Samana tradition, as far as I know, to shave your head. Right, it's a, it's another shaving your head and wearing robes is um, in this way is a way of kind of separating yourself, right? So that people know that you're different. So this, you know, kind of insignia of a bald head to a Brahmin was like, a, you know, hey, I'm going to call you a, a shaven-headed ascetic, shaveling, baldy, right? So that's where this is. For a second time and a third time, Gatikara addressed Jyotipala. Come, dear Jyotipala, let's go to see the Blessed One, Kasapa, the Perfected One, the Fully Awakened Buddha. For I regard it as holy to see the Blessed One. For a third time, Jyotipala said to him, Enough, Gatikara. 
What's the use of seeing that baldy, that fake ascetic? Well then, dear Jyotipala, let's take some bathing paste and powdered shell and go to the river to bathe. Now, the question is, how did they bathe with a uh, paste and a shell? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question, right? I don't know. I'm sure somebody knows or somebody has a, an educated guess. Yes, dear, replied Jyotipala. So that's what they did. Then Gatikara addressed Jyotipala. Dear Jyotipala, the blessed the Buddha Kasapa's monastery is not far away. All right, you get what he did there now. <laughs> he's trying to he's trying to get um, you know trying to get Jyotipala to come see the Buddha, and he's like, no, 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 no. I don't want to see this, you know. Um, and he says, well, let's go take a bath in the river instead. <laughs> and as they're getting close to the river, the Gatikara is like, well. Buddha's not that far away. Let's go see the Buddha. <laughs> Gatikara is persistent. Hello, Amy. Welcome. Uh, dear Jyotipala, the Buddha Kasapa's monastery is not far away. Let's go see the Blessed One Kasapa, <clears throat> the perfected one, the fully awakened Buddha. For I regard it as a holy to see the Blessed One. When he said this, Jyotipala said to them, Enough, dear Gatikara. What is the use of seeing that baldy, that fake ascetic? For a second time and a third time, Gatikara addressed Jyotipala. Dear Jyotipala, the Buddha Kasaba's monastery is not far away. Let's go see the Buddha, the Blessed One Kasapa, the Perfected One, the Fully Awakened Buddha. For I regard it as holy to see the Blessed One. For a third time, Jyotipala said to him, Enough, dear Gatikara. What is the use of seeing that baldy, that fake ascetic? Then Gatikara grabbed Jyotipala by the belt and said, Dear Jyotipala, the Buddha Kasapa's monastery is not far away. Let us go to the Blessed One, Kasapa, the Perfected One, the Fully Awakened Buddha. For I regard it as holy to see the Blessed One. So Jyotipala... What did he do? He get, oh, you're going to grab me by the belt? I'm going to undo my belt. <laughs> you don't have me. You don't got me this time. So Jyotipala undid his belt and said to Gatikara, enough, dear Gatikara. What's the use of seeing that baldy, that fake ascetic? Then Gatikara grabbed Jyotipala by the hair of his freshly washed head and said, dear Jyotipala, the Buddha Kasapa's monastery is not far away. Let's go see the Blessed One Kasapa, the Perfected One, the Fully Awakened Buddha, for I regard it as holy to see the Blessed One. Then Jyotipala thought, it's incredible, it's amazing how this potter Gotikara, though born in a lower caste, should presume to grab me by the hair of my freshly washed head. This must be no ordinary manner. Right. So, you know, obviously this lower caste person grabs a Brahmin by the hair. That's a, that's a no, no. Right. That's not good. Right. Now, obviously, obviously, obviously they know each other. Right. So he's not going to take it as a as a huge insult. It was more of like a wow. You know, he's not taking no for an answer. He actually grabbed my hair. He knows that that's not that's not good in society that people do that. that. If somebody did that, you know, uh, to another person, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be good for them to do that. So he's like, this has to be something interesting. <laughs> something must, must be going on. And so then Jyoti Pala says, Hey, he said to Gatikara, you'd even milk it to this extent, dear Gatikara. I'd even milk it to this extent, dear Jyoti Pala. For that is how holy I regard it to see the Blessed One. Then, well then, dear Gatikara, release me. We shall go. Then Gatikara the potter and Jyoti, Jyotipala the Brahmin student went to the Buddha Kasapa. Gatikara bowed and sat down to one side, but Jyotipala exchanged greetings with the Buddha and sat down to one side. 
so this is another thing where you see, if you read the suttas enough, you will see a variety of ways that people interact with the Buddha. Right? Gatikara comes and bows and sits to one side. Chirtipala comes and says, hey, what's up? How you doing? And then he just, you know, stands to one side, right? And <clears throat> there are some, some that come and announce their clan. I am from the clan such and such. And then they stand to one side. And then there's some that don't do anything. They just totally silent and they stand to one side, right? So this is the different, the different greetings and the different levels of respect um, that are given depending on the person um, coming to see the Buddha. What's good, venerable sir? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gatikara said to the Buddha Kasapa, Sir, this is my dear friend Jyotipala, a Brahmin student. Please teach him the Dhamma. Then the Buddha Kasapa educated, encouraged, fired up, and inspired Gatikara and Jyotipala with a Dhamma talk. Then they got up from their seat bowed and respectfully circled the Buddha Kasapa, <clears throat> keeping him on their right before leaving. Then Jyotipala said to Gatikara, Dear Gatikara, you have heard this teaching. So why don't you go forth from lay life to homelessness? Don't you know, dear Jyotipala, that I look after my blind old parents? Well then, dear Gatikara, <clears throat> I shall go forth from the lay life to homelessness. Then Gatikara and Jyotipala went to the Buddha Kasapa, bowed and sat down to one side. Gatikara said to the Buddha Kasapa. Right, so this is an interesting um, this is an interesting thing, right? Gatikara actually wants to be a monk, right? And you see this from, you know, you talk to people, they kind of think, well, I want to be a monk. And some are kind of you know, playing with the idea, but some are serious, but something in life is keeping them from becoming a monk, right? So Gatikara is one of these people. He has to take care of his blind old parents, right? But he's still Buddha Kasapa's foremost supporter, right? You'll see um, as, as we go along the sutta here. So Jyotipala has decided, hey, this is, you know, this is pretty good. Why don't you become a monk? Maybe he's thinking we'll become monks together, right? That happens. <clears throat> the uh, the first 60, well, after the first five ascetics, but after that, the, the, the next 60 monastics, the next 60 bhikkhus that were, became bhikkhus under the Buddha were actually all young men of a certain town, <laughs> Who were following their their you know their popular friends into becoming monastics so it does happen where friends will say hey let's let's become a monastic under the buddha got the car see now now look then got and jody palo went to the buddha kasapa bowed they both bowed, right? So after hearing a talk, after being gladdened and, and uh, raised by Dhamma from the Buddha, now Jyotipala bows and sat down to one side. Gatikara said to the Buddha Kasapa, Sir, this is my dear friend Jyotipala, a Brahmin student. Please give him the going forth. And Jyotipala, the Brahmin student, received the going forth and the ordination in the Buddha's presence. Not long after Jyotipala's ordination, a fortnight later, Buddhikasapa, having stayed in Vebalinga as long as he wished, set out for Benares. Traveling by stage, he arrived at Benares, where he stayed near Benares in the Deer Park at Isipatina. King Kiki of Kasi. Now that's a heck of a name, right? King Kiki of Kasi. <laughs> I like that name. Heard that he had arrived. So you have ancient Buddha, and now you have ancient king. Before King Pasenadi and Bimbasara. So King Kiki of Kasi 
had he he had the finest carriages harnessed. He then mounted a fine carriage and along with other fine carriages set out in full royal pomp from Bainares in the, to see the Buddha Kasapa. He went by carriage as far as the terrain allowed, then descended and approached the Buddha Kasapa on foot. He bowed and sat down to one side. The Buddha educated and courage fired up and inspired him with a Dhamma talk. Then Kiki of Kasi said to the Buddha, Sir, would the Buddha, together with the mendicant Sangha, please accept tomorrow's meal from me? The Buddha Kasapa consented in silence. Then, knowing that the Buddha had consented, King Kiki, uh, Kiki got up from his seat, bowed, and respectfully circled the Buddha, keeping him on his right before leaving. And when night had passed, King Kiki had a variety of delicious foods prepared in his own home. Soft saffron rice with dark grains picked out, served with many soups and sauces. Then he had the Buddha in form of the time, saying, Sir, it's time. The meal is ready. Ah, Chris is going already. It's a quiet night in the chat today. The total opposite of yesterday, but that's impermanence, isn't it? All right, one day it's active. The next day, it's inactive. Such is the way. So. Sir, it's time the meal is ready. Then Kasapa Buddha, robed up in the morning and taking his bowl and robe, went to the home of King Kiki, where he sat on one seat spread out, together with the Sangha of Mendicants. King Kiki served and satisfied the mendicant Sangha headed by the Buddha with his own hands with a variety of delicious foods. When the Buddha Kasapa had eaten and washed his hand and bowl, King Kiki took a low seat and sat to one side. There he said to the Buddha Kasapa, Sir, may the Buddha please accept my invitation to reside at Benares for the rainy season. The Sangha will be looked after in the same style. Enough, great king, I have already accepted an invitation for the rain's residence. For a second time, for a third time, King Kiki said to the Buddha Kasapa, Sir, may the Buddha please accept my invitation to reside at Benares for the rainy season. The Sangha will be looked after in the same style. Enough, great king, I have already accepted an invitation for the rain's retreat. Then King Kiki is thinking, the Buddha does not accept my invitation to reside here at the rains retreat in Benares. Became sad and upset. Then Kiki, uh, King Kiki said to the Buddha Kasapa, Sir, do you have a supporter better than me? Bad question to ask. <laughs> If you, especially if you don't want the answer. Great king, there is a market town named Bebalinga, where there's a potter named Gatikara. He is my chief supporter. Now, great king, you thought, the Buddha does not accept my invitation to reside for the rains in Benares, and you became sad and upset. But Gatikara does not get upset, nor will he. Gatikara has gone for refuge to the Buddha, the teaching, and the Sangha. He doesn't kill living creatures, steal, commit sexual misconduct, lie, or take alcoholic drinks that cause negligence. All right, so he follows the five precepts. He has experiential confidence in the Buddha, the teaching in the Sangha, and has ethics loved by the noble ones. He's a stream enter. That's That means stream entry. He is free of doubt regarding suffering, its origin, its cessation, and practice that leads to cessation. Stream entry. He eats in one part of the day. He's celibate, ethical, and of good character. Now, <clears throat> this is interesting, right? Because we have a lay person who is living at home with his parents, but in many ways, he's living like a monk, right? He's celibate. He's only eating before 12. Right? Also, and it keeps going. He has set aside gems and gold. So this is a lay person that is not handling money. It's a very rare and interesting thing. 
He's put down the shovel and doesn't dig the earth with his own hands. Again, he's not digging the earth. That that's a um, uh, there's multiple rules with monastics regarding to <clears throat> harming plant life and digging the earth. Right? We can't do any of that, or we're not supposed to anyway. Which idea is that, Adriana? Millionaire, I'm glad that you're having a blast reading along. Very good. It's always nice to see somebody enjoy the suttas. Oh, hey, Dallas. Welcome. Adriana must not be around. Well, they are. Suttas are intimidating. They definitely are. Um, it takes a while. And it also takes somebody who can make them a bit more relatable and fun, right, to get into them. Like, I can remember my early days of reading the suttas. Like, the only thing I could do, I, I mean... I. I could barely read for many years. I didn't like, I'm going to read all of the Majjama Nikaya, all of this, such. I didn't do any of that. I didn't do that. I basically, <clears throat> one of my favorite things to do was to go to access to insight.org. And they had a, um, they had a little button called random sutta. So I would just click on that and a sutta would come up and I would read it. And I'd be like, yeah, this is, I'm not connecting with this. This is too much for me, whatever. I'd click on it again. So I'd read the suttas in that way. Or I'd listen to monks, like when I was on Second Life. The people, if you know about me on Second Life, that was my online sangha. That was the only sangha I had. That was the only place I could listen to monks give talks, right, and be live, right. So that was my place, and I would hear the, the monks read suttas and things on that as well, right. And then once I became a staff member there, and you know I'm a lay person, and <clears throat> the woman Delani who was the co-founder of the place, she's like, I'd like you to do a sutta session. I'm like, a sutta session? I barely know. How am I supposed to do the sutta session? Like, you know, and it was a struggle. I mean, so we're talking, oh, what are we talking? 2010-ish? Yeah, about 2010-ish. So, I mean, I've come a long way in, in 11 years with the suttas. But, I mean, it, at that point, 2010, I'd been, I'd been reading the suttas three or four years by that point. Something to that effect, right? So, I mean, <clears throat> it takes a long time. It's not easy, you know, and you have to kind of get over the repetitiveness, right? You have to kind of understand why it's there and that it's not a big deal. Um, Brandon, are you on our discord? <laughs> are you missing the suit of memes? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we make, we make the uh, suit of memes. I do post them on my, on my um, Buddhist memes album on Facebook. So if you're not on the discord, you can do that. Um, Oh, you read the first sutta of the Majjama Nikaya as your first? Oh, my God, Adriana. <laughs> oh, no wonder. Oh, yeah, that's going to confuse the heck out of you. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> I remember. I actually remember that the ver on, on the Discord, the Sutta Mondays, the very first one. That was what we read. We read that very first one, and it was rough. We were all kind of like, "What's going on?" <laughs> that is not. That's not easy. Oh yeah, jeez. All right. Robert says, "I find the repetitiveness makes more sense if you read it aloud." Yeah, that that's a good point, right? Remember, these texts were handed down orally. They're not like written book. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right. So that's why if you really like suttas, come on the Discord and uh, join us for Suttas Mondays, where we read through the suttas, right? We've read through all of the Majjhima Nikaya. We're almost finished with all of the, well, actually, 
we're pretty stuck in the Terry and the Terragatas. <laughs> Those are taking forever. But eventually, soon, hopefully maybe by the end of this year, uh, we'll get into Samyutta Nikaya, and we'll be reading that for a bunch of years. It took us four years to read the Majjhima Nikaya every Sunday night, something like that. So, yeah, don't worry. If it's... Don't if you're overwhelmed by the suttas, that's normal. You're going to be. It's going to take a long time. Okay, so let's get back to Gatikara. We are about uh, two thirds of the way complete, so we're getting there. Um, there's not too much left in the sutta. He set aside gems and gold and rejects gold and money. He's put down the shovel and doesn't dig the earth with his own hands. He takes what is crumbled off by a riverbank or been dug up by mice or brings and brings it back in the carrier. So he's talking about clay, right? Because he's a potter. When he has made pot a pot, he says, anyone may leave to bag sesame, mung beans, or chickpeas here and take what they wish. He looks after his blind par blind old parents. So <clears throat> he makes, he, he has a trade, right? He makes pottery, but he doesn't charge for it. It's basically like honor system, like, you know, take what you need, leave me some food. That's a pretty interesting way of living, right? <laughs> that that's, a, that's an interesting way of living. He's living like a monk in a way, you know? Robert says, which Nikaya is a good starting point other than the Majima? Um, hmm. That's a tough one. I would say the, the Kudaka Nikaya. <clears throat> so that's the, the Dhammapada, Itivutaka, Udana. Terry and, Terry and Taragatas, like those are are good places to start, right? Sutta Nipata, which is among the oldest of all the Buddha's teachings, right? So all of those smaller books, other than the Majjhima Nikaya, is a good place to start. Robert says, it seems like living the life of a monastic as a layperson would be easier during the time of the Buddha. I mean, living by the novice precepts and not handling money would be near impossible. Um, yes and no. Like, I have met people who essentially live. Like, I was, a, I was a monk. And I was living at a monastery. And I met lay people who worked less and practiced more than me. <laughs> I was like, what the heck is this? What did I become a monk for? That these how do these lay people get to get to practice and go on all retreats and be all over and like it seems like they meditate more than they work. <laughs> what, what? Why did I become a monk? No, obviously not. But yeah, that's a. <laughs> Sometimes it's like where are these? You know, <clears throat> what did Ajahn Brahmali say about the lay people who who? Uh, live more like monks than some monks do. So what I would say is if you can try to live by the eight monastic precepts, right? So eight monastic precepts includes money. Like there's no, like it's when you go up to the 10 precepts, that's when you lose money, right? Um, and also, as we get along, Gatikara is a noble one. He's he's not a regular person, right? Um, he's he's higher than a stream mentor too. So that's a different that is a different story as well. Um, <clears throat> but um, but if you what I would say is, and I tried this as a lay person, I tried to live by the eight precepts in my daily life. And it just, it wasn't working. It just, I think I lasted maybe about three weeks and I was like, yeah, I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm a lay person. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, I might, I might be on the road to becoming a monastic, but I'm not. This is not going to work right now. So. Adriana, you're skipping ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think he was a non-returner. Let, let's continue on. And since he has ended the five lower fetters, that's your key right there. If he's ended the five lower fetters, he's a non-returner. The last five fetters, cutting them off, is reserved for our hunts only. All right, so Gatikara will be reborn spontaneously and will become extinguished there, not liable to be returned from this world. <clears throat> then this one time, great king, I was staying near the market town of Vebhalinga. Then I robed up in the morning and taking my bowl and robe, went to home of Gatikara's parents, where I said to them, excuse me, where has Bhagava gone? Your supporter has gone out, sir, but take rice from the pot and sauce from pan and eat. So his blind parents are like, oh, hey, the Buddha's here. Have some food. No problem. Could we get a link? We're at uh, section 19.5. All right, so that's what I did. And after eating, I got up from my seat and left. <clears throat> then Gatikara went up to his parents and said, who took rice from the pot and sauce from the pan and ate it and left? It was the Buddha Kasapa, my dear. Then Gatikara thought, I'm so fortunate, so very fortunate, and that the Buddha Kasapa trusts me so much. Then joy and happiness did not leave him for a fortnight or his parents for a week. Another time, great king, I was staying near the same market town at Vebhalinga. Then I robed up in the morning and taking my bowl and robe, went to the home of Gatikara's parents, where I said to them, excuse me, where has Bhagavad gone? Your supporter has gone out, sir, but take porridge from the pot and sauce from the pan and eat. So that's what I did. And after eating, I got up from my seat and left. Then Gatikara went to up to his parents and said, <clears throat> Who took porridge from the pot and sauce from the pan, ate it, and left? It was the Buddha Kasapa, my dear. Then Gatikara thought, I'm so fortunate, so very fortunate to be trusted so much by the Buddha Kasapa. Then joy and happiness did not leave him for a fortnight or his parents for a week. Another time, great king, I was staying near the same market town at Vebhalinga. Now at the time, my hut leaked. So I addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, go to Gatikara's home and find some grass. When I said this, those mendicants said to me, Sir, there's no grass there, but his workshop has a grass roof. Then go to the workshop and strip the grass. So that's what he, they did. Then Gatikara's parents said to those mendicants, who stripped the grass from the workshop? It's the mendicant's sister. Uh, who's stripping the grass from the workshop? It's the mendicant's sister. The Buddha's hut is leaking. Take it, sirs. Take it, my dears. Then Gatikara went up to his parents and said, who stripped the grass from the workshop? It was the mendicant's dear. It seems the Buddha's hut is leaking. Then Gatikara's thought, I'm so fortunate, so very fortunate to be trusted so much by the Buddha Kasapa. Then joy and happiness did not leave him for a fortnight or his parents for a week. Now, this is an interesting one, right? <laughs> it's only a, Bu only a Buddha <laughs> to his most trusted uh, lay disciple. <laughs> is, is, uh, they're going to be like, oh, we'll just take your roof. No problem. Right, there's actually rules in the monastic code that monks don't do this kind of thing. 
right? Like there's a rule, like because a monk took like the the wood from the king's stores, right? He's like, oh, the king doesn't mind. Sure, I'll t let me take this wood, <laughs> right? So there's all kinds of rules like in this regard where like this would be not a good thing for monastics to do. But since it was a Buddha and his and his you know trusted disciple, it worked out well. Uh, da, 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 da. Now, uh, then joy and happiness did not leave him for a fortnight or his parents for a week. Then the workshop remained with the sky for a roof for a whole three months. The sky for a roof. That's a good way of putting it, right? But no rain fell on it. And that great king is what Gatikara the potter is like. Gatikara the potter is fortunate, very fortunate to be so trusted by the Buddha Kasapa. Then King Kiki sent out 500 cartloads of rice, sauce saffron rice, and suitable sauce to Gatikara. Then one of the king's men approached Gatikara and said, these 500 cartloads of rice, wow. <laughs> you're, mad, you're just one guy with and two parents and you get 500 cartloads of rice. Sir, these 500, 500 cartloads of rice so saffron rice and suitable sauce have been sent to you by King Kiki of Kasi. Please accept them. The king has many duties and has much to do. I have enough. Let this be for the king himself. That's Gatikara's response. Ananda, you might think. Surely this Brahmin student, Jyotipala, must have been someone else at the time. Now, most people probably would have thought, up until finding out that Gatikara was a non-returner, that Gatikara was the Buddha, right? But Gatikara couldn't be the Buddha because in his next life he became awakened. So, I myself was that student Jyotipala at the time. That is what the Buddha said, satisfied. The Venerable Ananda was happy with what the Buddha said. <clears throat> so that is the end of Gatikara the Potter. Let's check the chat here. Actually, I'm going to get a drink first because I'm getting a little... <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Of the eight precepts, I find false speech to be the one, the only one which I <clears throat> forget not to break until it's after it's too late. Speech is hard, right? Because speech, we're used to speaking without thinking too deeply about what we're going to say. That's why mindfulness is needed, <laughs> right? Mindfulness, sati, the... Um, Sati has the, the twofold meaning of recollection and a present moment mindfulness, right? So <clears throat> we need to remember to be mindful, right? We need to remember, we need to train ourselves to develop mindfulness so that when we speak, we, as I like to say, Think twice, speak once, or act once, right? Like the old, if you've worked around carpenters or if you cut wood or stuff, measuring and cutting, <clears throat> the old saying is measure twice, cut once, right? So I've adapted that. I say, think twice, speak once, right? And that's a, that's a good way to help you remember to think before you speak. Well, Robert Martin, it's um, right speech is four-pronged, right? So 
Musavada is um, speaking falsely. Don't speak falsely. Right? That's Musavada. I refrain from speaking falsely. <clears throat> Musavada Vedamani Sikapadang Samadhyami. Right? That's uh, from the uh, precepts. Then there's uh, Pisunaya. <clears throat> Pishunaya, which is divisive speech. So you're trying to divide people with your speech. Buddha says to be somebody who is a, <clears throat> who, um, what's the exact word? Who loves uniting people with their speech, right? Who, who revels in uniting people, right? And so don't be a divider. Be a uniter, right? So that's the peace unaya. Then parusaya, which is the um, a uh, uh, abusive speech, right? So speech that is rough, unpleasant, right? Some people say like cursing a lot and things like that. Um, I don't know if I 100% agree with that, but if you're among friends and you're that's what you do is curse, it's not quite the same. Because this is meant, <clears throat> this is meant to be saying words in a way that is not beneficial, not um, conducive to the person gaining any benefit from it, or taking the words in a good way, right? <clears throat> so not to be abusive in your speech, and of course stuff like. Um, you know, like gaslighting and, and, you know, stuff like that. You can use your speech in ways that really are um, not physically abusive, but mentally abusive, right? So you have to watch out with that regard. And then the last one is sampapalapa, which is blah, 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 right? It's all, it's just <clears throat> useless speech. <clears throat> Sorry about that. It's useless speech that is not beneficial. There's really no good reason to do it. Doesn't really help. <laughs> no, um, might not be abusive, right? It might not be rough, but it's not really. It's no. It's not really for anything good. It's just kind of speaking to speak, right? Speaking. How many? You know, <clears throat> how often do you? And the people you talk to don't like dead time, dead air, right? So you just speak just to fill this the the silence, right? Some papalapa. Yeah, yeah. My my preceptor Bhante G would always go some papalapa blah blah blah. <laughs> so that's I love that. So that's what I use it right. Yeah, Sampapalapa is like an onomatopoeia. Is the, I think that's the word, onomatopoeia, <laughs> where where it sounds like what it is. <laughs> Douse coming in with the hard truth. Idle chatter can be tough for people, especially if it's 95% of what their speech. <laughs> wow, yeah, that is. Well, see, that's what I realized. One of the things that I realized when I first started getting in this is like, I don't even have to say most of the stuff I say. <laughs> like, I really don't. Why am I saying this? It's like, why not enjoy? And, and, and so... Once I got into my practice, I started actually like enjoying the silence. Like it's okay to have, if you're talking to somebody and then there's a natural silence, I just let it be. It was like, oh, it's a nice silence. You can think about it, whatever. Um, so like I've trained myself to be okay with that silence. But it is funny to see people who, like, the, you know, for it might last two seconds, but then they have to keep talking just to break, just to make sure that that silence doesn't stay around. Mm 
<laughs> uh oh, and here's, so now uh, we're talking about having to deal with family. <laughs> <clears throat> Adriana, I would uh, Google gaslighting and you'll find out about it. It's essentially using your speech to make a person doubt themselves. It goes deeper than that, but that's about as quick as I'm going to say about it for here. But if you Google it, you'll find more. <laughs> You're still confused by it. All right, some chatter. Not idle chatter. It's pretty good. You know, it's talking about our experiences. That's part of the practice. A millionaire says, I'd like, I'd say that a double, it's a double edged sword. Idle chatter can just as well lead to fights and arguments. Yeah. <clears throat> so, idle chatter, you know, in, in modern parlance in America, I mean, I don't know what other countries have, but in America, like we talk about water cooler talk, right? So, like at the office, there's the water cooler, you go get some water, and then there's other people there, and you just start talking about things. Who's seeing who in the office? Who did what to who in the office? You know, I can't believe this person did to, did that to this person, you know, and they lost their promotion, yada, yada, all kinds of stuff, you know, all that stuff, right? The, the office politics. Well, the Buddha called that talk of the well, right? Because 2,600 years ago, there were no, you know, I mean, maybe in, in some rare places, this is before Rome was pretty early at that point. So not even that like in <laughs> very, very rare, maybe rich places. They had plumbing, like right? They had water traveling. Most people had to go to a well, right? So you, whatever water you needed, you didn't have indoor plumbing, right? You didn't have a sink. Oh, let me wash my, let me get, you know, open the sink. No, you had to go with buckets to the well to get your water. And so while you're waiting online, Hey, your friend from down the street is there. And so you're hanging out at the well, yapping, right? So the Buddha calls it well talk, right? And he'll use examples like talk about kings, ministers, men, women, um, <clears throat> armies, uh, heroes, um, oh, so there's a whole, there's a whole long list. So, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that the Buddha considers well talk. <laughs> ah, yeah, thank you, Adriana. Brandon's question is an interesting question. So... <clears throat> What I would say is, Brandon asked, isn't idle chatter good for purposes of creating a good relationship? I would say that idle chatter is good for purposes of creating an initial relationship. Like, for instance, um, when I meet people, especially people who are on Buddhist, like, I don't go to him, hey, uh, it's Bhante J. Uh, let me talk to you about suttas such as, have you heard about this suttas? You know, that doesn't, well, what is that going to do? They don't know, especially if they're not Buddhist. They don't know sutta this and Buddha, Four Noble Truths. I don't know. They, so they just, you know, hey, I'm meeting a monk. <clears throat> so I'll ask him, like, hey, what, what, you know, what do you do for work? Da, da, da. And then, you know, like, oh, hey, I did that. And, you know, like, <clears throat> Like when I'll come up to um, and when families are there, like the at Bavin and like when I was in New York City, the kids would come, you know, with the parents to give food, and they'd be playing video games on their phone, and I'd look and I'd be like, "Hey, I remember that video game. 
I used to play that. Like, you know, so like, you know, it is a way of kind of making an initial connection. Right. But it's not like if, if you start talking about like, hey, yeah, I was, a, you know, uh, Grand Theft Auto and then I did this mission and I did that mission. And, and you start like just talking about in depth about it. Then it's, it's too much. <laughs> it becomes it, its usefulness starts to wane after a certain point. Right. It's good for making an initial connection, you know, a person to person connection. But for a long time. Eh. you know i mean i don't know uh i i think uh, after a time it's kind of like well that's enough it also depends on what you mean by idle chatter i mean one of the things i did with my my best friend from lay life was we would have parking lot chats like so we would just start end up talking about everything we talk about the universe you know um spirituality politics a little bit like we would just have like these very deep talks and <clears throat> i don't know i guess you could possibly say that those were some papalapa but it also depends on the meaning behind it like they were actually like we were two young guys trying to find meaning in a way, you know, um, well, not too young. I mean, I was like, <laughs> I was like 27, 28, 30. So, but you know, so it was an interesting thing. So think about the intention behind the talk. And if the intention is good, you know, if, if it's, you know, for some kind of development of yourself, then I guess it's, you know, it's okay. Especially for lay people, you know, a lot of this is, you know, for monks, a lot of this is a bit more strict. But for lay people, it's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, lay people have to kind of talk about kings and ministers. And you, know, you have to talk about, like, you know, voting and, you know, who leads and who does this and who does that, all that kind of stuff. Your mom struggles to relate to you as an adult. Oh, that's a tough one, especially if you're if you are among her, if you're if you're among her children that are just becoming adults. Like a parent, you know, I don't know if you have any older siblings or whatever, but like a parent is like, well, you know, in many ways, their kid never gets past like a couple of years old. You know, like they still remember that baby, right? And so it's a hard thing for parents to kind of let the child die, essentially, and to develop a new relationship with the adult. That's not an easy thing. <clears throat> Are there any instances in the suttas of the Buddha teaching children, Robert asks? Not directly. There are suttas where children were there. Um, I don't know that I don't I can't give you any like exact suttas, but there's the one sutta where the Buddha is talking to the king and the king has his child on his lap and he is you know, the Buddha, um, he, he's at, he asks the Buddha, do you ever have to be hard on your disciples? And he's like, yeah, I do. And, um, you know, and so the king asked for, you know, kind of why, what, like a reason. And the Buddha said, you know, if your child was choking, what would you do? And he's like, and the king's like, I would put my finger, you know, and try to dislodge whatever he was choking. And the Buddha said, even if it caused them, you know, harm. And he says, and he's like, yes, even if it caused him harm, because, um, you know, it might be short term harm, but he would be alive. Right. So it's kind of one of those things. And then there's one of my favorite suttas, like somebody was talking to me why I, I have my, um, oh, yes, Amy, and, you know, teaching his son Rahula. Although, let's see, Rahula was when he first 
No, yeah, Rahula was pretty young at that in their first ones. Yep. So teaching his son Rahula. Um, and then there's also the one where um, that those of you on the Discord know because my nickname is Yaka Raja, right? The um, where a Yaka mother brings her child her children to listen to the Buddha, right? The Buddha doesn't talk directly to the children, but um, you know, but they're there. Robert says, I don't think it was really a thing during the Buddhist time other than for Rahula. I'm sure like when Buddha would give talks, you know, <clears throat> most of the talks say, you know, bhikkhus and they don't mention anybody else. But it's um, scholarship pretty much says um, that he was essentially addressing who was for lack of a better word, the highest ranking, the ones closer to him. Um, and there were people, other people listening, right? So I'm sure there were plenty of kids that heard the Buddha talk. Um, they probably didn't get much out of it if they were depending on their age, obviously. Aren't child monks common in Thailand? Uh, somewhat common, yeah. Um, and also there is a, um, in the, in the suttas, there's a seven-year-old arahant. Well, I feel like he's probably more in the vinya than the suttas. Hey, Ethan, welcome. What did I miss from Dow Syria? Ah, Dust says, I have a friend and we never go with idle chatter. When one of us has insight or something, something worth talking about, we just discuss it. Sometimes we won't even talk for weeks or months. Yeah. That's how I am with my friend now. Every once in a while, um, we'll just send a few messages back and forth on Facebook. So it is a rule that the Buddha the Buddha said that it was something like a child has to be able to tend to the farm animals or whatever to be a certain age to become a monastic. Right? So that is in the rules. It is in the rules that children can become monastics. Um, so the minimum age is seven. Seven and up, you can become a monastic. KJ says, I don't remember with the sutta, but we decided to call it the Levinia. That's the um, Sigalavata Sutta. Diganakai number th 21. Yeah. I believe that was directed towards a child. Uh, I don't think he was a child, per se. I think he was pro he was a young man. Um, you know, he was probably, I mean, it's just guessing, but my impression was that he was late teens, early 20s. So it definitely wasn't like a child child. Ethan chimes in. I think there's a weaver's daughter who hears the teachings from the Buddha and becomes a stream mentor, then dies shortly afterwards. Hmm. Ethan, that doesn't ring a bell. But if you find it, send it, send it to me on the Discord because that sounds interesting. Yeah, Robert comes in and says, Sigalavada Sutta, yeah. Diga Nikaya. Hello, Jim. Jim Salisbury. I remember reading about a child that had a photographic memory and the Buddha involved him in teachings where he asked the child something like, what was the 40, the four? 
and they would say the Four Noble Truths. I don't know anything about that. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that one. Now, there is a <clears> – <throat> what jogs my memory in that is um, when you become a Samanera, that's a line of questionings. Like, what is the four? What is the seven? What is the, you know, what is the five? And, and you respond to that. Um, but I'm not, uh, I'm not sure there was a story behind it, to be honest. Could be wrong. It, it could be in the Vinaya, um, but it doesn't ring a bell. There's a section in the um, Khandikas called the, the Pabaja, the going forth. Um, and I don't think I don't think that that's a story in there. Um, but again, I'm not sure. There's, you know, when you're talking about thousands of pages, <laughs> it's pretty hard to remember to make sure you know you know everything that's exact and where it is and all that kind of stuff. Ah, Ethan, it's Dhammapada commentary. That's that's why I don't know it. All right. Yeah, anything that's commentary, I pretty much, pretty much don't know, um, or at the very least, I'm not the best. <laughs> like I know the commentary for the Karaniya Metta Sutta. You know, it's like I know some of the the commentary stories, but but not a lot of them. Is there some place I can read the commentary to the Dhammapada? Hmm. The commentary. That's a good question. Like I know that I know that there are books, Dhammapada books, that also include the commentarial stories. But I don't know. Um, Robert, ask that question in the Discord. Remind me, and I'll see if I can find anything that might be in a PDF form or something for you. Like, I'm not sure the commentarial stories are available on, like, Sutta Central, the, you know, for for instance. All right, so we have a natural silence here. Why don't we do our guided meditation? All right, and when we come out of the guided meditation, we'll have a few, we'll have about 15 minutes. We can read from <clears throat> some of the uh, Samyutta Nikaya um, verses, still in the Deva, uh, the Deva Vagga, right? The Deva's coming to the Buddha. We haven't finished that one yet. Uh, we haven't read any of the um, the Samyutta Nikaya verses in about two or three Dhamma Paluses, I believe. So let's do our guided meditation and then we'll do that. <clears throat> Set your body up in a comfortable and stable position and that works for you. Whether sitting on a chair or a cushion or a couch, but don't slouch too much. If you're sitting in a chair or a cushion, do try to <clears throat> have your upper body as straight as possible with your spine in its normal curvature. 
You can lean against the back of the chair. That's fine. But don't put too much of your weight. Right? You're not trying to fully lean back. Let's take a few minutes to scan through our body for two reasons. First is to start to bring our <clears throat> awareness from the external to the internal. And the second is to start to set up our body in a comfortable and stable position that will be that will minimize pain and discomfort for the time that we practice. It's always good to take a little bit of time to do this practice before you sit. <clears throat> it may seem like it takes a while when I do the guided version, but if you practice it enough, it can only take a minute or two once you get skillful at it. Bring your awareness to your feet. Try to connect with any sensations there. What is the feeling of the feet pressing against the floor? Bring your awareness up through your ankles to your calves. And then to your knees. <clears throat> While you're scanning your body parts, if you notice anything that is causing an imbalance in your posture or small amounts of discomfort, now is the time to change your posture. Try to set your body up in such a way now that will lead to you moving as little as possible once the practice starts. Bring your awareness <clears throat> up through your thighs. What is the feeling of your thighs pressing against the cushion or the chair? Bring your awareness to your hips and pelvis, buttocks. This is a very important part of your body, posture-wise. <clears throat> the lower body acts as a firm foundation for the upper body to rest upon comfortably. just like the foundation of a house. So check to see that the position of your pelvis 
supports the posture and the balance of your upper body. Doesn't cause it to lean or slouch one way or the other. If you're on a cushion, check to see that your buttocks is evenly distributed on the cushion. Another important aspect of keeping a balance and stable posture. Take some time in this area to really investigate the impacts of how this lower body affects the posture and adjust as needed. Move up into the upper body through the abdomen, the chest. Check to see that your spine is in its natural position, not stretched one way or the other, slouching or leaning. But resting without much effort on top of the firm foundation of the lower body. Bring your awareness to your shoulders. Make sure the shoulders are hanging loosely, not scrunched up and tight. And bring your awareness down through your elbows and your hands. Check to make sure that your elbows and hands are in a comfortable position that supports the stability of your posture. And finally, bring your awareness to the head. If the posture is stable up to this point, without any slouching and leaning, then the head should be able to simply rest comfortably, balanced on the upper body with the chin parallel to the floor not leaning or slouching one way or another. And once you've set your body up in a comfortable and stable position, let the body go and take three deep breaths.
and then let the breath go. From here on in, we do not wish to manipulate or control the breath in any way. This body has been breathing from the moment you were born and will continue to do so until the second you die. It doesn't need you to do its job. Your job is to simply abide with the breath, observe and investigate it, to know it deeply. Watch as this body breathes in. Watch as this body breathes out. Continue to follow your breath as I give these instructions on metta. Metta practice is done with <clears throat> words and visuals. But the words and visuals are a means to an end. The purpose of metta is to develop a mind free of ill will. A mind full of friendship and goodwill for all beings. I will provide both words and visuals. And you can choose to use one or both or neither, it's up to you. Let us start our meta practice for the person whom we are often the most critical, judgmental of, person whom we might even dislike the most, person whom we ha might have the most trouble with. That person is ourselves. We cannot hope to give metta for the cosmos 
if we do not have it for ourselves. Because we are part of all beings that exist everywhere. So start by bringing up warm-hearted feelings and thoughts for yourself, like you would your best friend. Let's take some time to develop metta within ourselves, to permeate this mind and body with goodwill. You can repeat after me. May I find happiness. May I find peace. May I live in friendship with all beings. May I find release from suffering. When you say these words, we don't try to do them as a mantra or something that's fast and meaningless. Every time we say these words, <clears throat> we want to do so with sincere intention and hope, sincere Ill goodwill May I find happiness. May I find peace. May I live in friendship with all beings. May I find release from suffering. May I find happiness. May I find peace. May I live in friendship with all beings. May I find release from suffering. If you like, you can imagine a sphere surrounding you. Pervade that sphere with your metta, with your limitless goodwill. Fill it up like air filling up a balloon. Surround yourself in a sphere of metta. May I find happiness. May I find peace. May I live in friendship with all beings. 
May I find release from suffering. Now spread that sphere out to encompass the entirety of whatever building you're in. Sphere completely surrounding the building and all beings within it, large and small, seen and unseen. Lots of creatures, lots of beings live in that house, that apartment building, whatever building. All kinds of beings. May all of us in this building find happiness. May all of us find peace. May all of us live in friendship with each other. May all of us find release from suffering. Spread your sphere to encompass the entirety of whatever town or city that you're in. May all of us in this town or city find happiness. May all of us find peace. May all of us live in friendship with each other. May all of us find release from suffering. Spread your sphere to encompass the entirety of whatever state or region or province that you're in. May all of us in this state, region, or province find happiness. May all of us find peace. May all of us live in friendship with each other. May all of us find release from suffering. Spread your sphere to encompass the entirety of this earth. All the beings in this earth, large and small, trillions of beings, so many beings. May all of us find happiness. May all of us find peace. <clears throat> May all of us live in friendship with each other. May all of us find release from suffering. Spread your sphere to encompass the entirety of the Milky Way. Billions of suns. Billions upon billions of planets. 
Who knows what beings out there? We don't know them. But it doesn't matter. Whatever beings may exist in this Milky Way, may all of us find happiness. May all of us find peace. May all of us live in friendship with each other. May all of us find release from suffering. Spread your sphere to encompass <clears throat> the universe and beyond, wherever there might be beings in existence. May all of us in existence find happiness. May all of us find peace. May all of us live in friendship with each other. May all of us find release from suffering. Slowly start to come out of your meditation, moving from the external to the internal, becoming aware and fully present in the room that you're in and the live stream. Say hello in the chat. And we'll continue with the last 15 minutes. All right. Let's continue on in the time that we have with our readings. It's a reading heavy Dhammapalooza today. And we're on 150, which is with Gatikara. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's a Gatikara heavy <laughs> suit this Monday today as well, or uh, Dhammapalooza today as well. Ah, uh, but is that not in the cat's nature? It is an apex predator, or at least it once was a long time ago. All right, so with Gatikara, <clears throat> 150. Seven mendicants were born in Aviha, have been freed. With the complete ending of greed and hate, they've crossed over clinging to the world. Who are those who've crossed the bog? Death's domain so hard to pass. 
who, after leaving behind the human body, have risen above the celestial yokes? Upaka and Palaganda, Pukusati, these three, Bhadya and Bhadavdeva, and Bahudanti and Pingaya. Then, after leaving behind the human body, having arisen above the celestial yokes, you speak well of them, who have let go the snars, snares of Mara, who teach, whose teaching did they understand to cut the bonds of rebirth, none other than the Blessed One, none other than your instruction. It was your teaching that they have understood to cut the bonds of rebirth. Where name and form cease with nothing left over, understanding this teaching, they cut the bonds of rebirth. The words you say are deep, hard to understand, so very hard to wake up to. Whose teaching did you understand that you can say such things? In the past, I was the potter in Vebhalinga called Gatikara. I took care of my parents <clears throat> as a lay follower of Buddha Kasapa. I refrained from sexual intercourse. I was celibate, spiritual. We lived in the same village. In the past, I was your friend. So this is the Buddha. Um, you know, so what's been going on is that devas have been coming to the Buddha and giving verses, right? So this is the deva communing with um, uh, the Buddha, communing with beings who are not of the physical world, right? And so this is Gatikara, who is still in the divine abodes. He has not yet become fully extinguished. Right, so he was divine. So you got to think about the time frames in these realms, right? Like you could be in the divine of bones for probably millions of years, right, before you become fully extinguished. And those millions of years, you know, could be one year on earth, who knows, right? There's no, no knowing of this time frame, but we have in this Gatikara being a non-returner up in the heavens coming to say hello to the buddha right he's coming to light say hello to his old friend jyotipala in the past i was a potter in vebalinga called gatikara i took care of my parents as a lay follower of buddha kasapa i refrained from sexual intercourse i was celibate spiritual we lived in the same village. In the past, I was your friend. I am the one who understands that these seven mendicants have been freed with the complete ending of greed and hate. They've crossed over the clinging of the world to the world. That's exactly how it was, just as you say, Bhagava. In the past, you were a potter in Vebalinga called Gatikara. You took care of your parents as a lay follower of the Buddha Kasapa. You refrained from sexual intercourse. You were celibate, spiritual. You lived in the same village. In the past, you were a friend. That's how it was when those friends of old met again. Both of them have developed themselves and bear their final body. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's very poetic. Ah, a millionaire says, I'm a huge newbie, so I spend most of my meditation struggling with posture. Get used to it. You will be for years to come. <laughs> that is the way it is. That's normal, right? I mean, I, you know, I've been meditating 16 years and I still can't meditate for an hour without any kind of pain or issue. Very rarely. Sometimes I can, but mostly not so much. And a lot of that has to do with your kind of your body and your personal proclivities and all kinds of stuff like that. Some people can get sitting right away. Like they like, it's just, okay, I'm, Oh, I'm a sitter. It's good. You know, I can sit for a long period of time and other people struggle with it. <laughs> right. But it's not easy for anybody. Um, but it is easier for some than others. So it's going to be, you know, this is why I actually put such a, um, 
why when I do my guided meditations, I do that that scanning is so that you understand your posture, right? This is kind of what I did, taking basically studying my posture, trying to find the a good posture for me to sit for long periods of time for over years. I mean, you know, over a decade of trying this thing. And I tried all kinds of things. I said I try one cushion, two cushions, side cushions, no cushions. <laughs> I, I meditated with it all. Right. And um, so it's going to take a while. It's okay. Right. Yeah. Especially if you're a beginner, beginner, um, it's really good to work on trying to develop a posture that will cause you to have less pain, less struggle. Most of the pains that come from meditating, especially if you're meditating for long periods of time, it's your abdominal muscles right? And your back muscles stretching to kind of, you know, keep a posture, stuff like that. That's actually the cause of most of that pain, right? So use your posture, investigate it, right? Use it as an object of your meditation, understand it. So you'll understand the real fine, like when I sit down to, when I sit down, Right, I'm not, and I'm not doing a guided meditation because when I'm doing a guided meditation, I can't go too deep because I fall asleep or I'll go too deep and I'll forgot to say the next thing in the guided meditation, right? But otherwise, when I sit down, like I can tell, oh, this, this, my posture is a certain way. Within ten minutes, this is going to be painful. Like I, because I've investigated my posture so much. I can just take a minute or two and I can know, okay, this is good. This is okay. now that's not good. And I need to move my posture and all that kind of stuff. And because I, because of all the practice I've done with it. Right. So you do that, investigate your posture, look at it and you'll know, right. You, you know, over time you'll see <clears throat> if I sit like this, this is why, if you ever do it like a retreat with me, I'm kind of going like this a lot in the beginning. Like people are just kind of like, you're just okay, I'm just going to sit like this, but I'm like moving around doing this, doing that. And then, but once I settle in, like I, <clears throat> there's an interesting thing with when I get the right posture, when I get it perfect, I just go like that right into deep, states of concentration right into deep states of samadhi not jhanas obviously i'm i like i said like most of you know i haven't gotten into jhanas yet and if i did i couldn't tell you but you know like just like there's a something there's a certain way that if i get my posture just the right way my body my mind just completely totally forgets about my body and just goes right into you know deeper states of tranquility all right, so posture is very important, right? Um, so, and if you have trouble with your posture, yoga, you know, yoga, stretching, especially hip opener, hip opener stretches, very important, right? Um, so use your posture and developing your posture as part of your meditation practice. Understand your posture, right? Because then you'll understand the body. You'll understand what's going on. Like I do, I often talk about, when I talk about walking meditation, I will um, I will talk about how when I'm standing, like when you walk from one place to another and you stand, I'll talk about how one thing, interesting thing I've noticed is that there's no such thing as the body standing straight up. Doesn't exist. What's happening is the body is going like this. And your tendons in your calves and <clears throat> and your you know your ankles are like balancing it out, right? And you can you can observe that you can see the ten you feel the tendons move to balance you out to keep you balanced. So you're not like this; you're more like this the whole time, right? That's really what's going on. Um, but sometimes that's so refined that you think you're just standing straight and, and you're not moving right so this is the, these are the things that you can see 
and understand about the body when you investigate it. Uh, so I highly recommend doing that, All right? Investigate your posture, understand your body. This is part of Satipatthana, part of the foundations of mindfulness, and it will be of great benefit to you in the future. I wish I knew a lot of this stuff when I first started. <laughs> Would have saved a lot of struggle. But hey, you know, a lot of the what I, one thing I love to do is to give to people like the shortcut that took me years of struggle and suffering to to figure out, right? Make it a little easier on the next person. All right. So we, at the very least, we got to read Gatikara um, coming back to the Buddha. I think so. I think that's a wonderful thing that we got to see the story of Gatikara and then Gatikara come back. Yeah. All right. Well, Adriana, interestingly enough, I would say that I avoided any kind of body scanning, like as it like doing it in a guided meditation until maybe about the last two years. I never did. I never taught body scanning, but but I really realized this. Like, you know what? I I think this is, this is a good training to get people to reflect on their posture. Right. And so I, I told like in the guided meditation, I said we do it for two reasons. The first is that you're moving from the external to the internal. Right. And the breath can be very refined and subtle and hard to follow at first. Right. So you fo focus on something more gross. Right. So the grow the body is much more is not as subtle. It's gross. Um, gross. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's. Um, following a, something going on in your body, a sensation in the body can often be easier than trying to find the breath, right? Because that's a bit more refined. So that's the reason. And the second reason is to know your posture, right? I mean, literally, if you're sitting on a cushion and your buttocks is not like your sits bones, right? If you know yoga, the sits bones, if your sits bones are not basically on the same level of the of the you know on the cushion it will affect your posture the the um the position of your elbows and your hands will affect your posture right so you know these things right you as you practice you see oh okay oh yeah this is i gotta do this you know like you know i gotta move my position here so i can have a better posture so that i can last so that i can sit longer all right, let's do our um, sharing of merits, and then we'll call it a day. Dukkha patta chani dukkha baya patta chani baya soka patta chani soka huntu sabbe pipaniyo etta vatta cha mehi sampatang punya sampatang sabbe deva anumo dantu sabba sampatti sittiya Akasatta Chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Punyang Tang Anomo Ditva Charang Rakantusasanang. May the suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas, nagas, and yakas of mighty power, share in this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, friends. So, just some final housekeeping. Um, Monday through Friday, every morning, 8.30 a.m., uh, join us uh, for some nice views of the mountains and uh, a half hour of morning monastery experience. Um, so we do precepts. If you want to take precepts, we do some chanting. And then we do a, I do a little Dhamma talk, a little thought of the day. So that's going on every morning, Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. Same place, the, the um, Student of the Path live stream. Um, if you are interested in 
um, learning about the early texts and um, having the early texts be a framework and a focus for your practice, you can join us um, on our Discord. That Adriana, uh, there we go. Adriana, top notch. <laughs> that worked perfect, right? All right. And uh, I think that's it. So I hope to see you guys um, in the mornings at 830. Join our little group. Amy is one of those people who comes pretty often. And uh, we've been having some nice views of the mornings. <laughs> nice views of the mountains going in the clouds going by uh, as we do our chanting. And um, so I've covered everything. Until next time, friends. Sukihotu, may you be happy. Practice well and be well. I wish you a very spiritually successful and peaceful week.